Welcome to Smith Weekly Discussions, an occasional program for our readers and listeners of Smith Weekly Research. Please note this program is a private discussion and everything contained herein is for entertainment and educational purposes only. With that, we hope you're in a comfortable position, along with your favorite beverage, to enjoy the discussion. We remind our audience to examine the show notes attached to each of our shows to better understand how our program functions. Before we get into our discussion, we want to say thanks for questions coming from our audience at Smith Weekly, including Cyril O, Guy S, Todd A, and Ben H. Marcelo Lopez has returned to the show today. Marcelo is Senior Portfolio Manager at L2 Capital Partners, a Brazil-based asset management firm that provides a number of funds and services to individuals, companies, and pensions, to name a few clients served. You can learn more about the firm via their website, l2capital.com.br. Marcelo Lopez, welcome back to the show. Hi, Andrew. It's a pleasure to talk to you again. Thank you for the invitation. Well, Marcelo, how's things in your part of the world? What's uh, happening in the Sydney area? What are you up to? How are you feeling? Super fine. Thank you for asking. Uh, well, Sydney is just a brilliant place. The weather is fantastic. There's no lockdowns. So life is normal. Well, that's good. Hopefully other parts of the world can start to get there and have some more sanity. Give us an update on the uranium market here. What do you think? Uh, lots of stuff's happened over the last few months. What are your thoughts? Well, the uranium markets are quite lively at the moment, right? Uh, in, in my opinion, the whole thing is set up for a massive move in the price of uranium and hence in the price of the stocks. The demand this year should be much higher than primary supply, and I still see a lot of uncovered demand in the sector going forward. The narrative over the past few years, Andrew, has been that uh, there's a lot of uranium available, and that created a false sense of security for the utilities. The situation today is much different from where we were a few years ago, and I have never been as bullish on uranium as I am today, but probably a bit less bullish than what I will be tomorrow. Uh, I, I'm not going to go through everything. Our, our audience is familiar with the bullish thesis on uranium, but I will mention a few important things that happened this year and I, are worth uh, commenting on. So uh, number one is Russia. Nuclear energy is just over 20% of Russian energy mix. A couple of months ago, Putin said that he wants nuclear power to be 25% of Russia's energy mix by 2045. Now, it, it, it seems low. They are 20% today and they're going to grow to 25% by 2045. But to achieve this, Russia needs to build another 24 nuclear reactors. Secondly, China. A um, couple of weeks ago, the China's National People's Congress released more details about the way uh, the country aims to achieve its goal, uh, which is 70 gigawatts of energy of nuclear capacity by 2025. So they intend to build nuclear reactors along the coast. Basically, they will construct the Hualong One and, and almost mass produce it. Well, I've, I'm not sure I can say that, but what they are going to be, uh, that, 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 that might be an interesting analogy. Uh, then they say they will also invest in small modular reactors in addition to floating nuclear platforms. More interesting yet is that they say they will develop a low enriched uranium reserve to supply the growth of the nuclear fleet. So keep an eye on that. Besides, more and more people are starting to look at nuclear energy as an ESG investment, which it is. So uh, assets in clean energy, the ETFs, have grown to more than $16 billion from just $4 billion a year ago. And, uh, and the uranium ETFs have almost quadrupled in size over the same period. According to Bloomberg, these ETFs should achieve 3 to $4 billion over the next three years. Now, another thing is yellow cake. Uh, in the beginning of March, yellow cake raised an upsized $140 million through a share placement to buy uranium. They exercised the $100 million option they had with Kazatom Prom, and they should take delivery of the material by August. August. Uh, they, they bought three and a half million pounds of uranium, and that was great. Now, uh, on Monday last week, 
they announced that they have agreed to purchase an additional 440,000 pounds of uranium. And uh, together, the option to purchase uh, and the additional uranium purchase increased Yellow Cake's holdings from 9.3 million pounds to just over 13 million pounds of uranium. Now, remember, they are doing this in a very thin market, very thin. So, so much so that, you know, Kazaton Prom has until August to deliver this material. And they announced last week that they will need to go to the spot market to do it. Now, the, the news of last week came from, from Denison. They, they announced that they were going to raise money to buy two and a half million pounds of uranium in the spot market. I have been telling a few companies to buy physical uranium for a while now. Uh, but this move might have started a very interesting trend. I believe most people are familiar with the story of MicroStrategy and, and uh, its founder, Michael Saylor. And basically, the company looked into Bitcoin and decided to use its cash in US dollars to buy Bitcoin. Then, uh, soon after, MicroStrategy raised capital via debt, co convertible debt, uh, and used this cash to buy more Bitcoins. So for a while, there were more buyers of Bitcoin than Bitcoins being mined. And, and this news came uh, whilst there was, there was a lot of institutional interest on Bitcoin, and it made the price go up parabolically. Now, um, I believe what Denison was doing was something similar to that. They probably looked into, into Uranium and thought, you know what, there's, there's more demand than primary production. There's not much left in the spot market. Kazatom Prom and Chemical have low inventories as well as utilities, and they will have to buy uranium soon. And, and the price is extremely low, as the cost of capital at the moment is extremely low, and I believe uranium price might you know, go up substantially over the next few years. Buying uranium today is the best investment and best use of, of cash for my shareholders. Now, um, in my opinion, it will achieve a few things. Number one, it will help dry up the spot market. Number two, it will send a clear message to the market that they believe prices are low. Number three, the deal was oversubscribed, showing there's interest from investors, um, you know, and, and, and others might follow, creating a virtuous uh, cycle. And, you know, last but not least, it will accelerate the recovery in price, which will help the whole sector. Just the announcement from Denison that they will buy uranium uh, made the spot price jump from 27 and a bit to more than $30 a pound on the day. Uh, and then UEC announced as well that it was going to buy some. And I know for a fact that others, which I, I, I can't disclose now, have done that too. So. Amongst the uh, UBC, Yellow Cake, and Denison, there has been the total of almost 8 million pounds of uranium sequestered from the spot market. And, 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 and just a reminder, uh, the spot market had traded just over 15 million pounds this year, uh, so far. Um, Trades Tech estimates that 45 million pounds of uranium will be sequestered by 2026. This is a quarter of the demand and almost 40% of last year's production. And, 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 and by the way, Andrew, I, I manage the fund in Brazil and a good chunk of the cash is invested in physical uranium too. So if the trend gets traction, we might see a few companies front running the hedge funds and then hedge funds front running utilities. Very exciting times ahead. Marcelo, do you think Uranium Participation Corp will actually follow the coattails of Yellow Cake? and maybe raise and try to buy? I hope so, I hope so. They, the, the stock has been trading at a slight premium uh, over the last few days. So they have uh, all reasons in the world to, to go back to the market, raise some capital and uh, invest in the sector. And, and I think the timing couldn't be better because um, the, the spot market is down this year, as you know, and uh, he can scoop some pounds there and, and you know, start this, this movement towards the second half of the year when I think utilities will go back to the market. Would you care if the spot price dropped and went down into the low 20s? I, I don't see how that really would happen, but if it did, I wouldn't be opposed to it. But 
would you care if spot continued to drop a little bit knowing what we know in this market and what the outcome is do you really see that as a, as a blessing to continue to accumulate um, absolutely if prices fall and uh, uh, if the spot market prices fall and bring together the price of the of the shares of companies we invest in you would absolutely invest more um, uh, and, and, and by the way we are almost a hundred percent invested uh, today so uh, the, the the spot market is nothing the, the spot market is an adjustment market and uh, people put too much attention on it and, and because there's no other market being no no uh, you know not enough long-term contracts being signed people end up paying too much attention at the spot market but the spot market it's it's irrelevant to to the whole uh, to the whole equation these days yeah marcelo and that brings another question you know you mentioned your guys's you know capacity level right here uh with cash on hand and total investment here being near 100 percent if there was a decline in the broad market, potentially a liquidity event, or we get into an event where it makes sense to accumulate more uranium equities, would you guys open the fund and, and raise, you know, bring in some investors who were on the waiting list and bring in some more cash into the sector to free up some additional cash for deployment? Absolutely, absolutely. We are always looking for opportunities. We were able to accumulate uranium last year in, in March, especially after the, the the collapse in price they were extremely cheap in the beginning of of march and towards the end of the month they were ridiculously cheap so we were able to raise a bit of capital and invest in the sector and and since then we we opened the fund another three times to raise capital and to invest more so uh, our investors know that we are in for a marathon we are in you know one of the best well in my opinion the best risk return i've ever seen in my life if we see the prices go down without any justification it, it would be just a blessing and an indication that we're going to open the fund again raise more capital and to to deploy into the sector that's great and that's a point that you know i need to point out to the audience that while funds like you know l2 can come to an investor vip list and essentially you know people that have been on the list waiting to enter the fund can come in with cash most of them probably are still able to during a liquidity event but for the individual smaller investor or family office etc that's why it's just so important to have cash so having cash on hand is so important for these events because these events are just so rewarding that uh, it's really a mistake not to have cash. And if you're someone that's you know on a brokerage account and you're 100% invested with your own money, plus you're using the house's money via margin and you have no room, you have no room to do anything. And so when you have a liquidity event, you get screwed for lack of better words. And I think that's really important to point out here is that uh, cash when it's needed is is very handy and so always keep it or have the ability to raise it or bring in money if you're a fund and so i think that's really important to point out uh, andrew if i might intervene here uh you mentioned margin we are super against using margin to invest in uranium uh uranium is risky enough and uh it's volatile enough and 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 we believe that the returns we're going to achieve are really really interesting so we don't need to use margin and i don't recommend anyone to do that um if, if you want to participate in the, in the investment in uranium uh select a few companies or funds and and put your money on that but never uh never invest more than you can afford to lose absolutely agreed how about utilities you mentioned them maybe they come into the market later this year What's your thoughts there? I know a lot of people are getting impatient, but uh, you know, why aren't utilities buying now? Are they, you know, still coming off the party floor from Christmas and New Year's? Are they still coming off the COVID problems? What's your thoughts on utilities not buying now? Yeah, that, that's a great question, Andrew. And uh, this, uh, to me, was the most important question uh, when I started looking into this sector, uh, you know, back in in late 2017 um the prices were ridiculously cheap then it was they were under 20 dollars a pound and i said well listen i know the prices are going to go up and if i can see it why can't you tilt the see too you know um but the answer is it's it, it's more complicated than that 
And there are a few things that people should be aware of. So uh, the first thing is uh, how utilities buy their uranium. So basically there are three ways. So they can go to the spot market, which entails purchase with uh, delivered up to one year. Uh, they can use the carry trade, which is a bit, bit longer, up to three years, and in some cases maybe four. Uh, and the long-term market, which is where most of the contracts have been traditionally done. Um, so what happened after Fukushima is that there was a lot of material available. So utilities didn't need to buy for the long term. Traders would offer them to buy material now and deliver in two, three, four years into the future. So um, utilities then had visibility for the next uh, three years and, and they delayed contracting. And uh, that was great for them. But uh, we are now approaching a time in which the spot market is not going to be sufficient and many mines are either in care maintenance or just shut down completely. And it will get more and more difficult to find big amounts of material in the spot, which will reduce the carry trade. And besides the, the price differential between the spot and what some perceive as being the long-term price has shrunk significantly. And this will also reduce the carry trade. So uh, this will make uh, utilities think about the, the, the long-term contracts again, which is the most important market for them. Uh, the second thing is that the few buyers um, have very little incentive to call the bottom in prices. It's not that they are just going to get a massive bonus if they get it right. And at the same time, they are not punished if they pay more for it as long as this is the price available for everyone. Uh, you, you, you can look at the conversion price and you and I have had this discussion before. Uh, you know, uh, prices went up from $4 a KGU to more than $20 a KGU today. Uh, and no one got punished for paying more. It's a five time increase. It's not, that, it's not a 5% increase, it's a five times increase. And also, if you, if you want to imagine the, the few buyer uh, from a utility going to talk to uh, his or her uh, risk officer or, or, or CFO and say, okay, let's buy uranium at these levels and I think we should sign a long-term contract at $50 a pound. So uh, the, the risk manager in this, well, we, we, we'll look at the price and say, well, this is like $27, $28 today. Uh, do, do you want me to pay $50? There's not a chance. So there, there's more, there, there, there is you know, uncertainty in the sector. Uh, Exelon is threatening to close two of the best run utilities because of unfair competition from subsidized renewables. Um, and, and another thing that, that, um, that people have to be aware is what it's called the nuclear fuel cycle. And to simplify things, uh, the nuclear fuel cycle is mining, conversion, enrichment, and fabrication. And uh, you know, most of the of the people think that this is the is the you know the order that things happen. So utilities will, will go to the market, buy uranium, then convert it, then uh, enrich it, and then have it um, fabricated into into fuel. But um, what, what happens is that most utilities do it backwards. So they contract their fuel and work back enrichment, then conversion, and then uranium. And because of a bottleneck in the conversion market, uh, they couldn't make a decision on uranium purchases. Um, in addition, last year was a very important year for utilities, not only because of the impacts of COVID, uh, which you know, Andrew, it, it, it had a huge impact on, on, on utilities, but also because of the Russian suspension agreement, which affected directly the enrichment sector. Now, after the resolution of the Russian suspension agreements, and well, now that Honeywell is back online, uh, let, let's call it the almost normalization of the conversion market. Uh, utilities are, let's say, free to go back to the market again and secure the uranium they need. 
And uh, I, I talk to you to, to many utilities, and if you ask them if this is a good price for them to buy uranium, I'm sure the majority would say yes. But um, every single one of these utilities is dealing with a legacy of contracts. And um, last year, their cash flows were down big time, some up to 30%. So they are trying to conserve cash. Um, and uh, as, as these long-term contracts will expire in 2026 onwards, that at least the majority of these contracts, they should look into renew these contracts at least a couple of years before. So we are running against the clock. Well, they are running against the clock, I might say. And uh, we are coming from a period of abundance in uranium to a period of scarcity. And during this period, I think many utilities, as investors do, uh, they still think there's a lot of uranium for them. And, you know, utilities have a lot of uh, things in the, on their plates at the moment. And uranium contracted just took a back seat. But I think they're going to go back to the, to the market, as I mentioned to you before, uh, towards the end of the year to secure the long-term contracts. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, this, uh, if you look at the conversion market, the conversion market started going insane after, I think it was a Mexican uh, utility that uh, asked for, uh, for requests for proposal and got no offers. And then everyone realized there was not enough conversion in the market and then the price started skyrocketing. And um, I think with uranium, it might happen the, the same way. Uh, one day, utilities will ask for uranium for 2026 20, onwards, and there, will, there won't be any, any offers. And, uh, and then people will realize, oops, there's not enough uranium there. I should secure mine. And then we're going to see the price go through the roof. Sorry, it, it was a long answer, Andrew, but it, it, it's a very important <laughs> issue, and I think People put too much focus on the spot market and they should pay more attention to the term market. Yeah, everything moves slow. So like even the COVID effects, it's just a slow process. I mean, the sector is just dead slow. And then all of a sudden it's not. Just like you said, once one of the buyers figures out that, oh, this isn't working, there's no responses, this isn't normal. They make a few phone calls. Pretty soon that spreads to a few more phone calls. And then all of a sudden a sector that's just been dead, no action, dead telephone lines all of a sudden a lot of activity and here we go and that's the point that has not happened yet when it does everything will go fast and we'll take that i think that's a, a good setup we've got before us but uh absolutely agreed and, and you know look if it takes longer marcello if the spot price does nothing if it goes up a little bit nothing happens in the long-term market you know that's okay i think people need to be patient here that that's that's a good thing the longer this takes it's it's a good thing. It really is. I know that's I know that sounds counterintuitive, but that's actually the truth. It's uh, the big companies don't like a spike in price because it attracts lot of, lots of competition and uh, and even to raise capital. If you recall the, from the last uh, bull market, when prices skyrocket, every single company on the planet that tried to to you know to to say they were a uranium mining company to raise capital. And uh, it was very frustrating. If you, if you talk to the big companies, they were really upset with that. And at the same time today, many, many companies claim that they're going to be able to produce uranium once uranium reaches a certain level. But I don't think they will. And, and, and well, <laughs> I know they won't. And, um, and you know, it, it, it makes utilities comfortable because they talk to utilities as well and say, listen, I'll be able to to mine and my uh, all-in sustainable cost is around $30. Once price gets to $40, i will I'll be producing. So utilities get tranquil too. And uh, this is another thing that's impacting the sector and people will only realize that's not real uh, too late in my opinion. That's a good point. And one that doesn't get covered a lot is the effect over time of these fancy presentations that proclaim a price some people might actually be led to believe that, yes, the price is going to stay down. As a result of these portrayed low prices, people get more comfortable. Now, I know that there's a lot of smart utilities that are going to investigate the crap out of anybody they don't know in the sector. And there's a lot of people in the sector that they don't know. 
And those people are going to be investigated heavily, their projects critiqued heavily, everything is going to get poured over with a fine tooth comb as part of their due diligence process, which the utilities will do before they enter into any agreement. And at that point, that's when all the truths really are going to start to come out. So it's, it is interesting, that particular point in time, Marcella, that happens in the future, just this general thought, uh, you know, like $40 uranium, you know, all these things that are going to come online and all this stuff. The reality is, is that's actually not going to happen at all. There's going to be very few, and it'll take much longer, as we've discussed on prior programs, prior events, much longer than people think. And uh, because everything that's out there is portrayed in the best possible twisted way. Some of it might be true, but a lot of it's crap. And it's been twisted over the years. And if you can twist it again, twist it again, let's do another feasibility study. Let's do it an enhanced feasibility study. Let's do a feasibility study 3.0. And let's just keep doing this and recycling this crap over and over. And it's just absolutely true that uh, there's nothing better to do at the time other than try to spin it a different way. And you know, it's like how many colors of lipstick can you put on a pig? Pretty soon it gets old. That actually has an effect. When you compound that over years, I actually think that does start to have an effect on some of the market participants. And, you know, so it's going to, it actually, to some degree, in a positive light, that could actually be, end up being positive to some degree, especially when people start to figure out that not all 30 uranium companies or whatever number you want to attribute to potential producers not a lot of them are actually going to be able to produce and put cake in a can and get it shipped off and uh, go through the fuel cycle. Well, listen, I, I think so. And there's so much disinformation in the sector. And if you look at the, at the PowerPoints and you'll be amazed. But, uh, you know, people, uh, it, it's, there's a big difference between, uh, you know, cans, uh, pounds in the, in the ground and pounds in a can, right? So uh, to, to be able to extract those pounds, you have to commission the mine, you have to hire people, invest in CapEx, raise money. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of effort. And it takes years. And I would say 10 plus years in the developed world. And uh, people are not taking that into account. So if they, uh, listen, Cigar Lake, which is the biggest mining operation today, well, it's actually in carrying maintenance because of COVID, but um, uh, uh, you know, uh, Cigar Lake is scheduled to come to an end in 2028, and, and, and so what? You know, uh, they, they should be working on, a, on another project now to make up for the, for the pounds that are going to be lost. And people are still tranquil. I think they're going to be scared, uh, uh, Andrew, to, uh, uh, well, they'll see what's happened. But, you know, the, the, the first utilities to contract, in my opinion we'll, we'll get a fair price and we'll secure the pounds which is the most important thing for them chemical can increase production you, M macarthur river is in carry maintenance it can go go back to into production if they need it be kazakhstan can ramp up production as well but it gets to a point that you uh, you can't do much more uh, because your costs will go up too so they need higher prices that's what we're going to have. And there's no other way around it. Uh, if you want the supply to match demand, uh, price is the only thing that's going to determine that. Yeah, that's right. I also want to just point out that even some of these companies that might be questionable, not saying you can't make money as an investor, not saying any of that. There's lots of boats that'll float very well before they sink. That's normal. They all float before they sink. But also, we're not going to sit here and, and run companies down specifically because that's not something that's constructive valueless conversations. So just keep that in mind for the audience listening. But I, I do like the comment of the largest care and maintenance mine in the world. <laughs> and according to UXC, the uncovered demand by 2035 is about 1.4 billion pounds. And uh, one of the previous executives from Casaton Prom said last year that the world will need another two Casaton Proms by then. In, uh, in, in last month, Tim Gitzel from Chemical said that the world will need six MacArthur Reaper or, or Cigar Lake uh, mines by then. And uh, again, Cigar Lake, which produces 18 million pounds per year, will be exhausted in, well, in another seven years. So uh, the, the, yeah. this, uh, this bull market is being driven by a destruction of supply, not only increased demand, 
and it's very complicated and, and cumbersome to bring back supply. That's, uh, that's the big difference uh, in between this market and previous ones. And just to add on top of that, the, the quality of material and the production levels are, are generally in decline already at this point for some of these long life assets that don't have many years left in them. But also too, just the fact that, uh, you know, in the mining sector, I'm struggling too at this moment in time, but maybe you can think of one. There's not another sector that's that's more difficult in the natural resource business than uranium itself, just because of all the complexities surrounding it. I can't think of anything else that would be more difficult to mine and put into a can and get off to a conversion facility. Uranium is by far the most complicated. So that adds another level of expertise needed to be able to actually get it done. That's another piece I think people forget about. I mean, it's not like copper, it's not like gold, it's not like zinc or any of these others. Uh, this is actually a complicated process. I agree. Uh, and look, it, 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 there's no other market that has such an important secondary supply component. Listen, I, I, I've seen a lot and I learned a ton over the past few years that I've been involved in the sector. You know, pricing is funny. Um, the focus that people put on the spot market, the opaqueness of the sector, um, but, you know, the, the way you have to assemble the mosaic to figure out lots of things. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the funny thing about this market, and I don't think I've ever seen or heard about this before, is the fact that the two biggest buyers last year were the, were the two biggest producers. Uh, you tell people this and they say, how? It, it, it doesn't make any sense. But uh, it, this market is so inefficient that, uh, yeah, the, the biggest producers in the world, Chemical and Kazatom Prom, were the two biggest buyers last year. Uh, actually, Chemical has been the biggest buyer over the past uh, three years since they put MacArthur River in, in care and maintenance. Uh, they, they did the right thing, in my opinion, which is to preserve their tier one assets. And uh, they, they basically said, well, if the price is, you know, $20 or, or so, I'd rather preserve my assets and, and buy it from the spot markets. Now, uh, tell me a market in which the biggest buyer is also the biggest producer. It's, it's really unique to uranium, I believe. Certainly. Now, that's good. And I'm looking forward to having them write more checks this year. Yes. Looking forward to seeing that happen. And maybe we can write a few checks along the way, too, if the conditions are right. Yeah, and they will. There's no, there's no other way around it because they're not yeah. going to you know, bring a tier one asset to produce to deliver into this uh, low prices. And they did the right thing to to because of health and and you know uh, their uh, were they, you know they're complying with the ESG policies and they looking after their employees and their communities. They also suspended the production at Cigar Lake, which was a great thing uh, for you know to protect the the uh, the employees. But it's also preserving their tier one asset and putting pressure on the market too, because it's another 18 million pounds that did not come to the spot market. So Orano and Chemical will have to go back to the spot market to get some. And just a reminder that uh, Orano will shut down Cominac at the end of this month. So there will be more, let's say, they, they will have more incentives to go to the spot market and buy some more. You've got uh, lots of stuff happening here that uh, will have to be fixed at some point going forward. And for now, it's going to be drinking the cheap gin until we can get to the expensive gin later on. And uh, <laughs> well, long term contract reporting. Some investors are concerned about these deals behind the scenes and confidentiality, which might have a delay in reporting of long term prices going forward. You know, my position is that it really doesn't matter because eventually the results of these transactions have to show up in the financial reporting at some point. But should investors be concerned at all with reporting of long-term contracts? No, not at all. Uh, you know, as, as you mentioned, they, they will show up in financial results or, or the price reporters will, will pick up on them. And, and, and we follow this market closely. And um, as I mentioned to you last week, there were only two transactions in the spot. There were a couple of RFPs for uh, deliveries over uh, the uh, two years from now. So we, we follow the sector very closely. And uh, again, you never know, but there might be an RFP that comes unanswered. 
And I've heard of a couple of big companies that passed on RFPs uh, late last year in, in the beginning of this year. And that's a big signal that something is not right because they're not even uh, bid in the, they, they not even made, a, made an offer in the contract. And people uh, get spooked with that because they were supposed to. So people should just select good companies, focus on them, and, and um, you know pay attention at, at the financial results and what the price reporters are telling, and uh, pay attention to what management is saying when they come to these calls. Yeah, good points, and I wouldn't worry, sweat about it too much more than that. I think that's about right, and the time will come. Just be patient again. How about, uh, let's move on to another topic here. You've done some writing uh, at Info Money, if, if I'm not mistaken here, a Brazilian website. How are folks in Brazil reacting to the uranium thesis, Marcelo, at least from the, I guess, from the standpoint of the comments that are being written on some of these websites? Uh, what's your thoughts on that? Are they positive? What's the uh, the response coming out of Brazil? The reality is that I've got lots of nice feedbacks from Brazilians, so much so that most of our investors, uh, at, at least so far, are Brazilians. I'm, I'm, I'm actually blessed to, that I have to raise money in Brazil and not in, in Belgium or, or Germany or, or, or even Japan at the moment. Now, ha having said that, obviously there are people who criticize nuclear energy, and this is normal. The, the majority of people don't know a thing about nuclear energy, and the ones who, who think they know, know the wrong stuff. I, for instance, uh, used to hate nuclear energy until 2017 when I started looking at uranium. Uh, I, I used to think that the nuclear reactor could explode and kill everyone in a gazillion miles and all that. But the more I learned, the more I studied, the more I came to like nuclear energy. And I think it has a bright future. Now, uh, part of my job uh, now, and, and, and I guess that somehow yours too, uh, is to educate people in regards to nuclear energy talk about the benefits, explain the stories about Chernobyl and Fukushima in more detail to, uh, to people. Eh? And, and, and people are responding to that. You know, lots of people get that nuclear energy is the future, is clean energy and safe after you explain. So um, as, as Bill Gates said in uh, his 60 Minutes uh, interview last month, it's going to be difficult. But if one is serious about climate change, uh, one has to, to look at nuclear energy. No doubt. There's always someone that's not going to like what you do. And that's the case, whether it's nuclear power, whether it's uh, uranium investing, or probably I'm sure you've had a bad experience with at least one investor at some point who was unhappy that didn't see the big picture either. Uh, on the options market for uranium, Marcelo, the fact is there's not a lot of options out there in terms of what we're talking about here. And I'm not talking about warrants, but, you know, options that are listed on an exchange. And there's not that many that you can go after. I mean, there's a little bit in Europe. I don't think there's anything in Australia. And there's some stuff in the U.S., some stuff in Canada, but potentially there with Cameco. But uh, what's your thoughts on trying this market using options only? You know, any thoughts on that? I think it's not a smart idea, but uh, what are your thoughts on using options in this market where there's not really that many, no pun intended, there's not really that many options? I agree with you. The, the kind of investment uh, I do is what I call uh, narrow and deep, meaning that I, I know a lot about very few things. And that's how we manage to, to get ahead. Uh, I mentioned uh, to you uh, in, the, in our previous conversation that I worked in London for one of the biggest hedge funds focused on emerging markets. And uh, we have to, to beat at that time the MSCI emerging markets. And we did, every single year I was there, we did. Uh, and it was a lot of work. We would you know, buy things in Korea, short other things in Taiwan, hedge the currency, put stops, uh, hedge the whole thing with futures in Singapore and all that. And it was a lot of stress all the time, day in and day out, but we delivered. Now, uh, after I left the hedge fund and started thinking about it, uh, you know, I, I would have made a lot more money for my investors and myself if I had just bought Vale, for instance, and let it run a lot more. 
So uh, when I founded L2 Capital, I followed this idea of narrow and deep. Uh, uranium is the single best investment opportunity I've ever seen in my life. And I believe it's going to be an awesome investment, Andrew. Uh, and this is not the kind of investment you want to play with options. Uh, one, the stocks are not that liquid for a fund of a decent size to play with options. Uh, second, you never know when the stock is going to run. Uh, imagine you, you had a portfolio of options that expire in one month when prices are down and, you know, they're, they're, they'll become very dust. The next month, the stock prices double and you're going to be extremely disappointed because you've done the work, you were right, but you lost money and you lost a great investment opportunity too. So um, honestly, I, I don't know anyone uh, who made money uh, using options in this market. Uh, there might be people, but um, I just don't know them. Uh, options are good uh, to help uh, you, know, you express your views when there's something that will be impactful for a company, like uh, results, mergers or acquisitions, uh, some sort of corporate, corporate action. Now, I, I believe Options are like short selling. They, they are not for everyone, you know, just, just for a few skilled investors that know how to operate it. Um, now, if I may, and you touched on the subject, um, in the uranium space, one can get warrants, which are very similar to options. Uh, they, they offer a solid upside, but without the risk uh, if you participate in a private placement. Uh, so, so just to explain to people what I'm saying, when a company is raising capital, they normally sell shares that are discount and give investors warrants, which are similar to, you know, uh, long-term options, meaning that they can be converted into shares in a future date at a set price. So this is something that we like, and we try to get as many as we can, uh, as long as it comes from a good company that we like and have a positive view for the next few years. Basically, that's it. I think the only place you, someone might try some options, but it depends on your strategy. And again, if you're in uranium, I don't think you should do this anyway. But if you have like a large position in Cameco and you're trying to earn income, you know, you might use a part of that position for selling covered calls and you might sell some puts for more shares at different price levels based on technicals. You could play that game. But again, if you're in this sector and maybe I can get your thoughts on this, Marcelo. You know, we contend and have contended for quite some time that the meat of this sector is in the juniors. And if you're going to take the risk and come into uranium, you have to come into the junior side. And that's the place where you're going to do well playing out this thesis. So if you believe in the uranium thesis, you have to come into the juniors and you can't play conventional options. You have to get serious. And that means warrants. That means writing checks on private placements. And that means getting into the junior sector. What's your thoughts? Sure. Now, if, if I can just go back one step, uh, we are obviously professional investors. So uh, last year in uh, our Brazilian fund, uh, in which we are entitled to invest up to 20% in uranium, and, uh, and we have, we end up buying options of chemical. But we did that because there was going to be a big inflow that we knew in our fund in a month and a bit. So we want to get the upside that we're going to have, that we thought we we're going to have, and we end up having actually. <laughs> so we end up uh, using part of that money to buy call options on chemical, which we did really well. So having said that, it's not for everyone. Uh, in regards to the juniors, I, I think you're right. I think the more uh, the risky you go to, the, the, I think everyone who's going to invest in uranium is going to make money. People who invest in, you know, uh, yellow cave or uranium participation will will make a decent return. Uh, people who invest in, in chemical, because that's on prom, will have a fantastic return. And people who invest in the developers and, and others, uh, the let's say the mid and small size companies, will make a killing. Uh, but they will incur more risk, of course. So you have to be aware of the risks you're going to run. Uh, when you invest in a small company, sometimes it, it, it might become a mine, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it has a mine and we'll go back to production, sometimes it won't. Maybe if you go back to production, go back to production, it will have some other kinds of problems. Um, 
you know, operational problems and all that. So you, you have to know really well what you're doing if you're going to go to that risk, uh, that kind of risk. But yeah, by definition, the more risk you run, the, the better it's going to be your returns. So uh, I, I agree in the sense with you, Andrew, that if you go to the, to the small size companies, you're going to have a much nicer return overall over the next two, few years when I think this, uh, this whole uh, uranium thesis will play out. Marcella, you and I've been in this sector for going on five years or or you know just shy of that in the four year range. Over the time that you've been in the sector, we've continued to do a lot of work and it's taken a lot of it it's taken a long time to get to a point where we're very comfortable knowing what needs to happen and, and what will make that happen and what people and companies in the space will also contribute to that happening. When you've done that, like you and I have over time, do you see that there's a de-risking that occurs with certain companies as you spend time on them, as you spend time talking to all the management members, you spend time talking to people who are independent in the sector, who know those companies and know those people. As you continue to move through, as you and I have over the last number of years, do you see that that risk through that knowledge and through that research and through those communications starts to take away to where we can make larger investments based on our work? It's a pretty good question, Andrew. Um, I, I think the obvious answer is yes, uh, it has, because we know more about it and we are more confident with our positions than we were maybe two years ago or, or, or three years ago even. And, um, and, you know, we, we know the story, we know how it's going to end. Uh, we, we know the risks uh, to the uranium thesis, which might be a, a nuclear accident or China, you know, the, deciding not to invest in nuclear reactors anymore, which we think both are uh, very, uh, you know, very low probability risks. Uh, but as we, we keep investing in the sector, in, in, in companies specifically, and the companies promise to do A, B, and C, and they start delivering on that, uh, in, within the time frame they promise to do uh, an on budget or below budget, we, we become more confident that they can deliver in the other stuff that they are promising to. So we, we can pretty much increase our exposure to these companies and uh, and you know uh, and, and and follow uh, follow more uh, closely. So yes, I, I think the more we the more time we spend in the sector, the more confident we become, and uh, and the better investors we we become too. Marcelo, before we wrap up here, just one more question on maybe on the some of the sector equities before we get into L two. Um, is there any company out there that's stood out more so to you? Maybe you can talk about uh, maybe a company or two that you might like at these levels. Any thoughts on just the sector equities uh, that you can share? Sure. Sorry, Andrew. I, I, I actually don't disclosure any positions we have, but uh, I would just mention to investors that it's a minefield out there. So many companies are promising um, you know um, X, Y, and Z, but um, I would I would suggest people look at the, um, history. Many of the the companies that are listed today were listed in the in the in the last bull market, or you know at least uh, the management company had worked for a uh, for a uranium company in the previous bull market. So you can pretty much uh, check what they said then and what they delivered and what they are saying now and what they will deliver. Um, and very few of these uh, management companies that participated in the previous bull market are here today. So um, I, I would just encourage investors to look into this. And it's a lot of work. You have to go back you know, 15, 20 years and look into the, uh, what they were saying then and, and, and how it played out and, and look at what they're saying today again. But um, and, and, and also I will be a bit skeptical of companies that change their names to, to put uranium there somewhere just to, to um, uh, you know, grab attention from, from investors. Uh, so again, it's a minefield out there. People should be, should be uh, paying attention to where they put their money. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I would just encourage the audience to uh, to look at sources of information out there. There are certainly some places where L2 has disclosed they're a holder. So we just encourage people to go take a look for themselves and track down some of that information. And the ASX filings is a great place to look back in history. And also in Canada, CDAR is also a fantastic place to uh, to do some really heavy lifting and looking over decades of filings. And you're absolutely right, Marcel. There's very few magicians out there, you know, jockeys, if you will, that can create a uranium gold copper co and make it all work. There's <laughs> yeah. very few that have that kind of expertise. I'm not saying that there's nobody, but there's certainly a, a couple I can think of. But uh, yes, good points. And L2 Capital, how about the performance? If you want to just mention anything to the audience, I'm sure there might be a few folks that are actually interested. Any performance you want to point out during 2020, I'm sure you've done some calculations, maybe compared to 2019, any points on that? Yeah, well, uh, in 2019, our, our fund was down a little bit, maybe made in a, in a bit, 9%. Uh, last year, our fund uh, went, went up by almost 200%. So we, we, we did super well. And uh, and that's what you expect from uh, you know an active fund, right? Uh, we, so we we beat the ETFs, which is what we get paid to do. Uh, and 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 I believe we run less risks than the than the ETFs in the sector because we know what we are doing. We follow the companies, and uh, we we don't need to invest in certain areas, certain regions, or certain companies just to just because they are part of the index. Yep. First and foremost, when it comes to ETFs, it's about the fees. First and foremost, hands down. Well, Marcelo, to wrap up, is L2 Capital open to new capital at this point? If so, perhaps you can mention some of the requirements for some of the potential interested audience. Listen, we, we are, our main fund will be opened again for investors at the end of this month, at the end of March. The minimum investment is 250,000 US dollars. Uh, with two-year lockup, that's pretty much it. We we normally have uh, quarterly openings of the funds, so whoever does not uh, get this one can can probably get into the the June one. Okay, and then is there a contact at L2 they can get a hold of to get their name on that list and also get the final details and requirements? Sure. Uh, well, they can send an email to myself if they want to. It's marcelo at l2capital.com.br. Or they can send me a message on Twitter and I'm pretty much respond all of them. At M.A. Lopez 1975. Hey, good chat and stay well out there. Keep up the efforts in the sector and I'm sure we'll uh, do this chat again soon. Fantastic. It will be my pleasure, Andrew. And thanks for the invitation. Always great to talk to you.